Randy, in a nutshell, what is Darwinian medicine and what can it tell us? It's very simple. It's using everything we know about evolutionary biology to prevent and cure disease. This means that there are a lot of things we need to do differently. Some we've already been doing very effectively. We do evolutionary genetics quite well and we're doing it better and better. We're using evolutionary biology to understand bacterial evolution and antibiotic resistance. Oh, yes. It's already oh. been done well and we can talk more about that in a minute if you'd like. But this larger picture is what George Williams and I have tried to get across. It's this sense for what the body is as a body, not a machine, and really all comes down to asking a question that has not been asked as seriously as we'd like to see it asked. That question is, why isn't the body better? Why didn't natural selection make us better? And to simplify things, we list six possible reasons. The first one is that other things evolve faster than we can, so it's no surprise we still get infections. The second one is that the environment is different now than it used to be, so our, we can't evolve fast enough to keep up. So the first two are because we can't evolve fast enough. The next two are because natural selection can't do everything. There are a lot of constraints on it. It can't go back and start over again, and there are going to be mut mutations creeping in, so the information store is going to get corrupted. Uh, just can't, can't do better than that, that's then natural selection stuck with it. Closely related to trade-offs, even in machines, like in bodies, nothing can be perfect, because if you made it absolutely perfect, um, the cost would be too great. You could make a car that would go a thousand kilometers on a tank of gas, but the whole back seat would be taken up with a gas tank and it would blow up every time it got hit by another car. The final two explanations are not really explanations for why natural selection didn't make us better, it's explanations for how we misunderstand the body. In particular, we, have, we think that the body was shaped for health, and of course it was not shaped for health. It was shaped for maximum reproduction, and this explains a lot. And the last one we've just been talking about is defenses. Fever, pain, nausea, vomiting, and all the rest are not diseases. Their defenses shaped by natural selection, and their regulation has been shaped by natural selection. So these six things are possible answers to the question about why natural selection has left our bodies vulnerable to disease. Our bodies are so fabulous in some respects. Our heart keeps beating and never takes a five-minute vacation for decade after decade after decade. That's astounding. Our eyes work so well, late into life for most people. But we have an appendix, we have a wisdom, wisdom teeth, birth is difficult, uh, many people get nearsightedness. And the combination of some things being so perfect and other things being such botched jobs is what should make us all sit up and take notice that this is not a machine. This is something that's been shaped by natural selection. It has a lot of vulnerabilities built in that can be explained only by how natural selection works. If you had your way, could you uh, uh, retrain doctors to think differently? And w how, how differently would they actually act when they're faced with patients? You know, there are a lot of specific things that doctors can do differently as they understand natural selection better. For instance, using drugs to block pain and vomiting. Um, if you think more evolutionarily, you'll do that slightly differently Mostly, of course, you'll do the proper research uh, to get the answers. I don't think natural selection actually tells doctors practice differently immediately. What it gives doctors is a more accurate sense for what a body is. So when a doctor sees aging, many of them think of a machine breaking down because parts break. But once you start recognizing that that's not just what's going on, that every aspect of the body breaking down is involved with some trade-off that probably has advantages, and talk about how practical this is. We're now finding specific genes that are involved in aging. Uh, would it be very wise for just to go and knock out those genes? We soon may well have the capacity to do that. If you're thinking just from a mechanical point of view, that sounds like a good idea. But if you understand the body from an evolutionary point of view, you'll hesitate carefully and say, we've got to study this before we start knocking out genes that natural selection has preserved. Why do males tend to die younger than females? Oh, yes. You and I were <laughs> members of the feeble sex, aren't we? I think it's not quite fair. So it just doesn't seem fair, does it, that guys like us are going to die on the average seven years younger than women? You'd think, especially natural selection, if it wanted to favor males, could have at least allowed us to live longer. Um, but we don't. So is it just here in this country and in Western society? No, it turns out to be every place. I got data from the World Health Organization that lists mortality rates, what percentage of people die at each age, for 20 different countries at different ages of life. And I wanted to figure out, for every 100 women who die, how many men die at age 20? And my guess was, oh, about 120 men die for every 100 women who die, about a 20% excess. 
But when I looked at the data, for every 100 London women aged 20 who die, 300 men die. The death rate is three times higher. I was flabbergasted, even though I was a properly educated doctor. No one had ever mentioned this. And then I looked at 20 other countries, same pattern in every country. It ranges between about 2.5 and 5 for that peak. And then I looked across the age span, throughout the entire lifespan, males die more. So how come? Why did natural selection discriminate against men? And of course, once again, we're back to trade-offs. Um, males that invested more in competition and certain kinds of muscular vigor and all the rest um, ended up having more offspring than other men. There's variation in the amount of investment in that kind of reproductive competition. For women, competing for mates doesn't influence the amount of babies they have very much. Uh, most women can find a mate and they don't have to compete in the same way. As a result, natural selection has, has invested much more of life's energies into mate competition for males and less in females. So for us, we have less investment in repairing our tissues. And as a result, so we die. Those 300 that you mentioned, mm. what, what are they actually dying of? We actually looked at that. It turns out that for the 20 leading causes of death, 19 of them are higher for males. And we also looked to see if it was all explained by riding motorcycles without a helmet and drinking too much too fast and unsafe sex. Uh, about half of it's accounted for by those behavioral kinds of factors. But cancer, um, lots of other things as well, pneumonia, they're more frequent and more deadly for males. So our bodies seem to be designed, and it's in other species too, of course. If you look at chimpanzees, you see the same pattern. The males are competing and fighting and dying young on average. So let me see if I got this right. We're all governed by compromises, and there's a compromise between reproduction and long life, and that applies that's, to that's both That's the sexes. big compromise. That's, that's the big right. compromise. But the compromise comes out at a different place for males than for females, because for females, they can reproduce more if they live a longer time and, and have a child and then another one and then another one and then another one. But for males, it's not like that? Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, in a sense, they can live longer. And some people have suggested, in fact, particularly Ruth Mace, who does research right here at University College London, has looked at whether lifespan for females has been increased because women make good grandmothers and therefore help their own genes. Well, I was going to say, because, I mean, on the face of it, we're contradicted by the menopause, aren't we? Because men can go on reproducing well into old age. So in that, women can't. in that same 1957 paper, George Williams suggested a possible explanation for menopause. He said, it may be that after a certain age, the risk of pregnancy in terms of killing a woman and resulting in the death of her existing children back in ancestral times would be so great that it would be better for her to stop reproducing herself and instead take care of her children and her grandchildren. Now, since then, there have been a dozen papers published on this with mathematical models and data. And it's beginning to look like he had the right idea of an answer. It looks like women who do stop reproducing may have a better ability to care for children and grandchildren, and, and they get in a, it's still a controversial issue, actually. Were all of us descended from an unbroken line of ancestors, not a single one of whom died young? Yes. But they all potentially died old, many of them died old. Would that be a, one way of summarizing uh, the, the whole Darwinian medicine and those who died Message. at age 20, on the average, had fewer offspring than those who died at age 40 or 60. So indeed, uh, everything is a trade-off and there's variation, uh, which has resulted in selection for genes that maximize reproduction. Usually they, reprodu they maximize health also, but not always. So we're really not designed for health, we're designed for reproduction. And if there's any competition between those, uh, reproduction wins. That's right, absolutely. It's a sad thought, isn't it? It doesn't mean we all have to rush around reproducing like crazy. No, it certainly doesn't. <laughs> In fact, it might make you think that maybe natural selection has played a bit of a trick on us, um, encouraging us to do things that are good for our genes, but not necessarily good for us. I think it is important to remember that although natural selection does explain why we're here, it doesn't provide us with a, a recipe for how we ought to behave it necessarily morally not. or politically or anything like that. No. And even I mean, finding out that on the African savanna, there were good reasons for eating a lot of fat and sugar. That's not a good reason for eating a lot of fat and sugar. And what's worse, even knowing that doesn't really change much our ability to resist eating those tasty things.